Mighty Ape is Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore with everything from movies, music, games, toys, books, hobbies and more. Mighty Ape is your one-stop shop for the things that matter most. They constantly have hot deals and exclusive promos. And if you visit their website on the click-through banner on fakechef.net's homepage, then your purchase will help support Good Movie Monday. Mighty Ape, Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. You mean to wish me a good morning, or do you mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Please go away. Let me speak for the love of God. That is. That's hands down. That's best piece of music to signify the arrival of cops in cinema history. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm shocked that they had that kind of sense of humour. <laughs> Let's have a listen to that. Absolute genius, mate. Absolute genius. I think this is going to be a fun episode. I, I think so too. <laughs> the track is, if you are listening, of course they're listening. <laughs> Why wouldn't they be listening? <laughs> it's pigs. I mean, if you haven't been, just rewind. <laughs> It's Pigs by Billy Green, and it's from the soundtrack to the 1974 cult classic Stone. If you keep listening, there is more gold where that came from. Happy New Week to everybody. Thanks for dropping by. You are listening to Good Movie Monday, the podcast presented by FakeShamp.net, home of the nerdy cinematic ramblings. The show comes to you with the support of Four Pillars Gin, The Lunar Drive-In, Astor Theatre, Umbrella Entertainment, and our friends at Eagle Entertainment. My name is Glenn Cochran. I'm the guy that sits here and talks way too much. And uh, possibly the most reliable co-host on the other side of the desk is Ben Helwig, lover of clamshells, hater of tricky roundabouts. I, I, don't, I don't understand them. There's three roundabouts to get here, three roundabouts in like immediate succession. <laughs> I don't understand it. I'm always find myself in the wrong lane. Like it should be, it should be like it is in America where they don't have roundabouts. You just come to a four way intersection and manners dictates when you go. Manners in America, it's amazing. What is going on anyway, mate? I don't get it. Oh, what is go- <laughs> in so, general, uh, I'm just in. I'm still. I'm stuck in roundabouts. You really. Uh, you literally you get stuck in off. roundabouts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I give way halfway through. I'm like, oh no, you come in. Oh, I thought you were going to say you that. give up halfway through. <laughs> I just park. <laughs> How's things been over the last week? Yeah, good, good, busy, good. Busy is good. Uh, have you watched anything exciting? Just. Uh, well, I've been cramming stuff in for the show. And uh, <laughs> and that's about I, it. I rewatched like the entire seven seasons of The Good Wife. Did I say that last week? You certainly did. Yeah. So okay. So I did that. It was last week. <laughs> I've been watching Invincible okay. on Amazon Prime. And that's good. Based on a comic, the mm-hmm. by um, um Jonathan Kirkman, the same guy who did Walking Dead. It is great. It's Excellent. super gory and violent. Cool. Um, and a lot of fun. Uh, oh, well, I can't wait to hear what you've uh, been watching in preparation for this show. Um, but cheers to all of you who are listening. Our loyal listeners, it's always great to be talking to you. If you are a newcomer to the show, then you've picked a pretty radical one to start with because our guest today is none other than the legendary Aussie actor Roger Ward, star of many cult classics, including Mad Max. And Were you going to say something? I was going to say he's the nicest man in film and television. I was also going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> He's also been in Turkey Shoot, Young Einstein, the pirate movie, just to name some. But today is all about Stone, uh, that biker movie with teeth that that many consider to be the precursor to Mad Max. The conversation with Roger is coming up, but rather than talk about Stone for the entire episode, Ben and I are going to use it as a theme, and we'll be talking about movies uh, involving motorcycles. Oh, was that? Well, oh, okay. Was that the thing? <laughs> it was just biker movies. I had a whole bunch of ones based on. Uh... <laughs> You know, like blue, st- like no, was it <laughs> Silver Streak, where, where Kevin, Kevin, uh, Kevin, what's his name, is the bike courier. <laughs> oh um, yeah, the, is that the Gordon James? Le- the, what's his name? Yeah, oh no, and then there's the there's the yeah that one as well, which is a great film. Um, I can't remember what that's <laughs> that's called. A that's a bicycle. That's a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, that's the great. It's all from my my favorite uh, my favorite film, Super Troopers, when he meets up with. <laughs> He meet like he meets up with his girlfriend, like they're supposed to be undercover, and he's like, she's like, what are you wearing? And she's coming like leathers, and he's in spandex. And he's like, you said, you said dress like a biker. Oh, well, 
Ben's going to be talking about biker films. I'm going to be talking about motorcycle films. No, my plan was that was my plan. I was I thought, I'm just going to do I'm just going to watch like Breaking Away and all these kind of bicycle movies. You must be chomping at the bit yeah, to no, talk yeah. about Wild Hogs. <laughs> I am 100 <laughs> percent. Like no joke. I, I think that's a that's a film that needs to be uh, revisited. Well, anyway, um, speaking of hogs, that was the sloppy intro. Uh, get your motors running because we're about to go. It's that time of week, Celebrity Death Watch, Ben. We got one! <laughs> <laughs> We're horrible people. Uh, we got two, actually. Um, Enzo Sciotti, uh, you might not know his name, but you will absolutely know his work. He's the artist responsible for so many iconic movie posters, particularly from the 80s and 90s. Uh, some include Evil Dead, I think all three of them. Mm-hmm. Um, Sword and the Sorcerer, good old Albert Pune film. Maniac, American Ninja, Bloodsport, Fortress. The list just keeps going on. Recruits, and on. Terminal Exposure. Okay, you want to uh, go on and on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare City. He's seventy six years of age, which is way too young. But um, what a legacy that guy has. Mm. Like he's phenomenal, and like the amount of stuff. Like I've only I only know him from his like VHS work he, that got out here. Yeah. But the amount of artwork he did for like the Italian cinema in the seventies mm-hmm. is phenomenal. Like one of my <laughs> one of my favorite uh, Andy Sidaris movies, Stacy. The the Italian name is La Porno Detective, <laughs> and he did the artwork for that, and it is amazing. Oh, awesome! But there's also like a pin interest page or something where there's lots of alternative posters. He's did done. you say pin interest? What, did I? I can't remember. Did I? <laughs> It's just, isn't it just Pinterest? Pinterest. <laughs> maybe, it, maybe it is Pinterest. <laughs> Somebody, um, let us know. <laughs> Pinterest, Pinterest. Yeah. Either way, you cut it. Um, there's a lot of alternative art of his on. Okay, Ben's got his phone out. I'm going to have to look this right. up. Is it? Show me up. Go on. Uh, you're relying on me trying things. <laughs> it's Pinterest. Yeah, Pinterest. <laughs> Pin- <laughs> Pinterest. <laughs> I was I was delivering that with an Italian accent in in tribute. Right, I see. I was going to say for someone who who must use Google image search with, <laughs> as much as I assume you do, like Pinterest would be something that comes. That up is all a the website time. I never use. It's a look. It's a major pain in the ass because you it's because you can't copy. <laughs> yeah, you can't copy. You have to have an account to look at anything large. Yep. It's a huge pain in the ass. But, you know, and they don't sponsor the show, so I can say that. Exactly right. And then we had uh, Richard Rush. He also left us last week. He's the director of some awesome movies like The Stuntman, Thunder Alley, Psych Out, and Colour of Night. <laughs> Not so awesome, but pretty Colour cool. of Night, and starring uh, Bruce Willis' as <laughs> Peen. <laughs> Absolutely. And for the first time ever, Ben, we've got somebody that passed away managing to tie his death into the theme of our show. Because he directed two Grouse Biker movies... In the 70s. Talk? No, sorry. <laughs> Hell's That's Angels 70s. on Wheels. Right. And The Savage Seven, which is a spiritual right. sequel. So, um, Vale or Valet, whichever you choose, I should say. I, I, thought, I just thought it was Vale. Yeah. And then I heard somebody say Valet on television. I'm like, ooh, that sounds like, weird. Like, were they sure they weren't trying to get their car parked? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, one quick thing about Richard Rush is he was also uh, notable for being the original director of Air America. He wrote the screenplay, was going to direct it, had signed Sean Connery on as a lead. You're right. And then he fell out with a producer and... Um, oh, they, they realised it sucked. <laughs> no, that's the one that they finally made. <laughs> I kind of like it. <laughs> of course <laughs> of I course do. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben, let's let's bang out our first one. Uh, I'm going to go first uh, because I know you're dying to talk about Cool as Ice, all right? So, <laughs> <laughs> But rather than actually talk about one, I want to take this opportunity to tell you about three hours that I wasted of my fucking life the other day. Um, I went back to look up some forgotten films thinking, you know, I can find some real doozies here. And I watched them both and they were shit, absolutely shit. So <laughs> I do not recommend you go back and watch Fast Charlie, Moonbeam Rider. With uh, David Carradine from 1979. Right. That is about the World War One vet from the 1920s who's competing in a cross-country motorcycle race. Feels like a Roger Corman 
as if he made Monte Carlo or bust. Like it's just. <laughs> well, that's the. I mean, yeah, it's got a carrot in it. Yeah, um, and uh, so does the next one. Actually, it's not Death Sport, is it? No, it's not. Uh, 1992's clusterfuck that is Roadside Profits. <gasps> I was going to talk, um, that is on my list, and I quite liked it. Oh, are you joking me, mate? Well, we can talk about it, but it, it stars uh, John Doe from the, the punk band X. And uh, all-time <laughs> favourite film, Roadhouse. Yeah, well, this movie feels like there's a little bit of Roadhouse in it, but Adam Horowitz as well, a.k.a. Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys. What a piece of shit this is. Like, it's one, awesome. <laughs> one guy meets a guy, said guy dies... Original guy drives his ashes across country to Vegas or wherever to spread his ashes. He's followed by a weirdo, played by Ad Rock, who has a fixation on Hotel Nine or Motel Nine, yeah, Motel Nine. franchises. They meet lots of stupid characters along the way, including John Cusack with an eye patch and a food fetish. Don Cheadle, Lynn Shay, David Carradine, um, Flea, Patty Tippett. Like, it's, it's, oh, Dick Rude. What yeah. a pointless Stephen fucking Jobelowski. movie. If Jim, Arlo Guthrie. This is Timothy a movie. Leary? This is a Jim Jarmusch movie, as if Savage Steve Holland had directed it. See, now that would be fucking awesome. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> that would be great. I thought it was. Look, I just thought it was very much in that kind of vein of those '90s road movies. It totally was, and it has that really kind of chilled out vibe. What's the one that um, Bob Gale directed that had the Pink Power Ranger trying to fuck everybody across the country? That, uh, yeah. You've got it over there, Interstate 60. Yeah, so it feels kind of like that kind of movie where there's yeah. an ensemble cast, but it, it goes nowhere. Like That's what I, I found really weird no, about they, this one. He, they, get, they get where they're going in the end. He does exactly what he... <laughs> but, you know, but, and then comes to some life life realisations. You do realise that the entire trajectory of this is essentially Fury Road because he gets to where he's going and then he comes back again. No, he doesn't come back again. Did you not watch the end? <laughs> I did, but I didn't care. He gets into it. He hitchhikes and he's like, uh, "Where are you going, uh, Idaho?" And he goes, "Yeah, maybe or Alaska if you go." Like he just he hits the road and Ad Rock kind of hooks oh, up with the teen hitchhiker yeah. and uh, you're right. You know, goes off to save the planet. But it, like right. it is just it just so has that. What you're saying is this is much better than Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, yeah, fucking <laughs> nice. <laughs> I but found then, it so... Look, I enjoyed parts of it along the way. I actually really enjoyed John Cusack in this one. Like, he was just... See, I, 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 I don't enjoy crazy John over, Cusack. Over the top, and I liked it, but um, I just... But it's I, good that he's only in it for five minutes. Yeah, that's true. I just found it just so pointless, man. Oh, no, I just... I really liked it. Like, it's... And it's written by by um, Abby Wool, who wrote Sid and Nancy, and it's written and directed by her, and she's done some other great kind of big films that I yeah. can't remember off the top of my head. But it just has this kind of... Kind of... Like the tone of it, the mood is like is, is like super chill and like a really kind of it's like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance without the actual <laughs> maintenance and the inner monologue. Yeah, right. Like I just thought it was kind of like <laughs> like the characters aren't as good as they are in Interstate sixty. That or mm. should I? They're not as obvious. Yeah, yeah. Like I did like the the Lin Shay um, parts were, were kind of funny, like her <laughs> like her story. Yeah. Um, and there's you know like. But the John, the John Cusack was the was the only one who's like all the characters in. But in tell State me, 16. tell me that bloody Ad Rock is not annoying as fuck in this film. He totally is, but he's supposed to be. Yeah, I don't like that. Like he's just this kind of whimsical kind of character that's just kind of intruded himself in on kind of John Doe's life. <laughs> and like I, I I like the thing. Like he meets that guy. He like he's been working at this plant, and they don't really tell you what it is. Mm. But this plant for like nine years while he's been building up his motorcycle. And he meets this guy in the parking lot who's there on his first day and he's like, this is a fucking nightmare. Like, working yeah. here, this place is a shithole. And uh, they go out for a beer after work and the guy gets electrocuted playing, like, Donkey Kong or <laughs> that, that's some hilarious. arcade that thing. That's hilarious. And he kind of tries to, you know, he because he, the guy tells him that he's an orphan. He's got no family. Mm. His family died in a car crash. Yep. So he... And then we find out from this girl at work that, he, no, his family like this well, well-to-do... <laughs> kind of people who live in the kind of in the hill in the you know fancy part of town so he he, he cremates <laughs> to the, the maid. guy he, <laughs> yeah. he, he puts it into it like the guy's motorcycle um Engine, fuel tank fuel tank yeah and takes it to the he like calls ahead and takes it to the family and they treat it with they she just throws it in the trash kind of almost in front of him so yeah. he decides to like honor this guy's request at this great time in his life where he where he <laughs> 
you know, had this time <laughs> at this casino. So he decides I'm just going to take it. And he thinks it's only going to be a day. You're making this sound way more deeper than it actually is. Yeah. No, I just, you know. Like, it looked, by no stretch of the word is it is a fantastic film. But it's, it is also very much like like one of you, like that Road, was it Road Trash? The, that, um, what's the one that you like? <laughs> I like it as well. The Canadian one that's. Oh, the, Highway 61? No, 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 no. Roadkill? Roadkill. Which is the first one of Highway 61. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Roadkill and um, That's a great Border film. Border Radio, with also with John Doe, is a kind of similar yep. type thing, except I think in that one they're, they're looking for John Doe mm. rather than he's well, anyway, the guy doing the look. What are the odds that I would bring that one up? You took exception to the fact that I didn't like this one, mate. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's like, I mean, it was a great movie, but I, like, it, right. I thought it was you know, definitely watchable. Well, considering that wasn't even a recommendation, do you want to... Uh, lint, um, there were two <laughs> anti-recommendations and you've and simultaneously ruined mine, but that's all right. I, cause I, can, <laughs> I, can, I can make up, I can make up the, the other one I'll talk about, but um, <laughs> okay, so I guess I'll, I'll start off with the kind of granddaddy of all 70s biker Oh, I know where it's films. going. Okay, what do you think? I'm no, gonna think no, 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 I want to hear what you You think, think. I... Think you think Easy Rider? No, oh, no, 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 no. Fuel. I was worried that would come into it. <laughs> no, Easy suppose, Rider Two. I suppose that kind of is like I mean, I mean cheap, shitty exploitation uh, uh, biker films. Not, Easy Rider uh, Two. Uh, ones made with Hollywood stars like that. No, no, it's uh, The Losers, aka oh. Nam Angels yes. from uh, 1970. I only like to watch movies that have ridiculous plots, <laughs> and this one <laughs> certainly does. Directed, funnily enough, directed by Jack Starrett, who. Most people will recognize as um, Galt from First Blood, the, the sheriff's deputy who tortures uh, <laughs> yeah. John Rambo in the prison cell and yep. he's on the helicopter and stuff. Totally. He's the one that gets killed. But this guy has directed a bunch of awesome 70s kind of right. exploitation cheapies. I had no idea. And, and The Losers is one of his. And this, I think Tarantino references The Losers a couple of times. I mean, of course he does. And it, The Losers isn't that great. Like, I mean, I, like I actually found it a bit of a struggle to watch. But mm. it is kind of cool. But it, it's stupid too. Like, the, the CIA, <laughs> it's set during Vietnam, of course. And the CIA, one of their operatives has been, uh, is being held in a POW camp in Cambodia, which is, at the time, it's kind of a neutral mm-hmm. uh, territory. So the American army can't go in to rescue him. So... This army major decides to get his brother, played by William Smith, uh, who is the head of a bikey gang, Mate. and also like they're also ex they're ex army, but they're all bikies yep. and, and kind of hippies. Um, to kit out their bikes, so they fly them over to Vietnam. They kit out their bikes with machine guns oh. and uh, rocket launchers and all sorts of stupid shit, and the, and go into Cambodia to rescue this guy from this uh, prison camp. And the it's incredibly racist. <laughs> throughout the film like incredibly so so trigger warning trigger warning and like it's it's I think the running time's about 90 minutes and it's 70 minutes of bullshit 20 minutes of like <laughs> awesome action at the end and it seems like like when they fire the machine gun they have to do wheelies for the machine guns to fire and stuff like that so it's a, a great excuse for like awesome stunts um but yeah, like I'm amazed so, that you didn't save this one for another upcoming show that we had agreed to do. What was that? Possibly about people rescuing friends from. No, no, this. I mean, this. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, they have to be college coeds uh, who go rescue friends from uh, the jungle. <laughs> wow. Uh, not, uh, not just not. Uh, yeah, lean, mean biker machines. Well, anyway, there you go. There's a whole bunch of movies you've probably never heard of. Um, but um, someone you have heard of is Jared Garner, and for good reason. Uh, lover of eBay, Dolby Atmos, and Pugs. Hey, this is Jared, and welcome to PE Class. Now, I'm not going to tell you what's coming out this week on Home Entertainment. But hey, that's because I did it last week. I messed up. I gave you a fortnight's worth of releases in the one update. So, look. <laughs> If you want to find out what's coming out this week on Home Entertainment, I kindly ask you to rewind to last week's episode and uh, have a listen. This week, to make up for it, I'm just going to give you some Home Entertainment news. How about that? Coming out locally on June 23rd is the box office behemoth Godzilla vs. Kong. Courtesy of Warner, this one's coming out on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray and DVD. And while there are no specs or special features to announce just yet, 
we can almost guarantee that it's going to have a Dolby Atmos track because it's currently playing in cinemas with Dolby Atmos and Warner seem to love their Atmos tracks. Then making its 4K Ultra HD debut in a limited edition gift set that's outrageously got a retail price of $90 is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The Gene Wilder Classic is headed to 4K, which is really exciting. I've got no specs or special features yet to disclose, and I can't actually tell you what's in the limited edition set as to why it would cost $90, but at $90, it'd want to have a fucking golden ticket in it. I can assure you of that. Then coming out from Sony Pictures in the States in June is Wolfgang Peterson's In the Line of Fire with Clint Eastwood and John Malkovich. This is going to have a 4K restoration from the original camera negative. It's got a Dolby Atmos track and all the legacy special features you can handle, including commentary, deleted scenes and featurettes. Then Criterion have a tasty selection of releases coming out in July 3 that have taken... Uh, Taken favour with me, uh, Bill Duke's 1992 Neo-Noir deep cover with Lawrence Fishburne and Jeff Goldblum. This is getting a 4K restoration and will have special features also, so you can finally toss the old Magna Pacific DVD out and upgrade to HD. Then Lizzie Borden's 1986 drama Working Girls is headed to Blu-ray now. I don't know if you know about this one, it concerns sex workers, but it's not a salacious exploitative film, it's a real slice of life drama about women working in the world's oldest profession. Now I caught this a bunch of times growing up, I used to play late night on Channel 9, and I was fascinated by it, so I'll definitely be picking up the Blu-ray. It's got a 4K restoration and a ton of newly commissioned special features as well as archival special features. Then lastly, from Criterion in July is Howard Hawke's 1938 hilarious bringing up Baby with Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant getting a 4K restoration and with a rather staggering amount of special features on it, including a 2005 commentary with longtime fan Peter Bogdanovich, which I'm really keen to listen to. Then Shout Factory's imprint label Scream Factory are releasing some great stuff this July. First up is David Cronenberg's adaptation of Stephen King's The Dead Zone. This is coming out in a collector's edition, and while Scream have yet to reveal what special features it'll have, I have said it'll have an all-new scan, so very exciting. Then Sean S. Cunningham's adaptation of Mary Higgins Clark's a Stranger is Watching is headed to Blu-ray. This is a Blu-ray debut, so I'm excited for it. Again, no special features to speak of. This will be a standard release, not a collector's edition, but we'll still have special features, so I imagine we may get a commentary track from Cunningham. Lastly, Dark Castle's 2005 redo of House of Wax is getting a Blu-ray release from Screen Factory and as a collector's edition as well. So this will likely port over that same existing transfer we've seen on the Warner release from the US and locally on the Roadshow on real Blu-rays, but we'll have probably comparative amount of special features to their releases of House on Haunted Hill and 13 Ghosts, which were just, wow, overwhelming. Uh, so very excited for that one. Do you remember the tagline for that one? See Paris die? And you did. It was good. Anyway, that's coming out in July. I'm excited for it. And the last one I want to mention is one that probably will make baby Ben Helwig very happy, and that's Brotherhood of the Wolf is getting a collector's edition release from Scream in July also. And so that's it for me for this week. Until next week, stay physical. Now, Ben, I would just like to formally apologise to you on behalf of Jarrett and, well, on behalf of Good Movie Monday in general because uh, we've we've let you down, mate. Last week, Jarrett failed to mention that there was a brand new Hallmark triple pack being released onto DVD. God damn it. Yes, it's the 11th collection and it features Bottled With Love, Love at Daisy Hills. And, I think I've seen Bottled With Love. And Love at Look Lodge. I haven't seen those. I haven't seen the last two, but I think I've seen Bottled With Love and it's so, great. Please accept our apologies. Yeah, we, I really need to uh, get on the phone. I know several people who know the guy who runs ViaVision and demand the entire Hallmark collection. Uh, they should sponsor the show by giving me all the Hallmark movies. Well, thank you for thank you to Jarrett. Nevertheless, um, I hope he has inspired you to go out and buy some physical media. Dude, Certainly. Let's get back to it. Let us talk about two motorcycle movies each. And how about we take in turns? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would like to give some love to possibly my favourite motorcycle movie of all time. Uh, far from the best, but my favourite. Uh, it's mostly a forgotten film these days. Certainly not easy to come by in Australia. It is called Beyond the Law. And to most people in Australia, it's called Fixing the Shadows. Yeah, Fixing the Shadow, yeah. Uh, 1993, directed by Larry Ferguson, who had previously written movies like Beverly Hills Cop 2, Highlander, Presidio, Hunt for October... Alien 3, like what a 
What a pedigree. Well, of, he was uh, doing all right until Alien 3 popped up. <laughs> and, well, this is the only one of two movies he directed, and it stars Charlie Sheen, Michael Madsen, Rip Torn, uh, Courtney B. Vance. It's just fantastic. Like, I can't imagine Courtney B. Vance as a biker, but like everyone else, awesome. I, I don't recall if he is a biker. It's been a while since I've watched this, but I just remember the impact it had on me when I first saw it, and then like movies that I often talk about, An Innocent Man and Dead Bang, these are movies I used to go back to all the time. And this one's kind of like Stone, because it's about a cop that sort of infiltrates a biker gang to uncover sort of a narcotics arms dealing ring, I guess. But dude, like, Charlie Sheen is on point in this film like he goes from like a straight clean cut brown nose to like a really filthy leather boy with a mullet it's like it's Fast and the Furious <laughs> it is Fast and the Furious it is Fast and the Furious that's a really good point I never thought of it that way yeah like 100% it's better than the first Fast and the Furious that's for sure it would be hard <laughs> I did, a, I did a shit this morning that's better than the first Fast and Furious. <laughs> like it was smooth, had a, had a velvety consistency, zero straining, barely touched the sides, minimal cleanup. <laughs> and it had a little bit of sheen. And it, yeah, it was like shiny. But th- dude, this was an era, lots of movies like this were coming out. A lot of them were DTV, um, but I just think this one was absolutely marvellous. Other than Apple TV in America, this one isn't anywhere. I, you know, you've probably got it on VHS. I was say, I've got it on VHS because I remember the trailer. Like yep. the tra- it used to trailer a lot on tapes. Yeah, um, I can't remember who brought it out. Jarrett will probably know because he's a magic man. But uh, <laughs> I do remember seeing the trailer quite often and going, "What is this?" I love it. Wouldn't it be great for some kind of company with balls to put it out on Blu-ray, like an imprint label or something like that? It would just be. Amazing. Like, yeah, like, or yeah, some companies imprint label, yeah. Yeah. Right. I think it has to be part of a package for them to do it, though. Oh, well. Like, to be honest, like, I love imprint. I think they release some great films, but I swear to God, it's like, it's like somebody puts their hand in front of their eyes with a dartboard of titles and they just, <laughs> there he goes, what are we going to release this time? Oh, let's put this one and this one together. Like, fuck it. Well, hell. surely, surely <laughs> Beyond the Law is not a hard one to wrangle. It's, yeah, it's all, yeah. Who holds the license? Who owns yeah. it? Which which bank? Because usually what happens is these films go bankrupt, or their library you know, and the library switches to someone, yeah. and no one knows who the hell has the or rights. Someone's died, and yeah. and it's disappeared, or you know, like a House of Horror, where every time you play it, <laughs> thirty people call up claiming to own it. <laughs> well, your turn. Uh, okay, uh, like I'm, I seem to be going chronologically here. Uh, my next one is uh, Chrome and Hot Leather from 1971. Which is a fantastic movie. This was this movie was pitched to me uh, by Michael Helms of Fatal Visions as bi- uh, Green Berets versus Bikers, Excellent. and that is exactly what it is. Starring once again William Smith, who is like a staple of seventies biker movies. Like if you needed, and ninety nine percent of the time he's playing a biker, but not always. But he is the <laughs> he's the biker, and the, it's about these four Green Berets. Uh, and one of the Green Berets, funnily enough, like I watched this on YouTube, so it is available and fairly easy to see. I do have it on VHS, but I watched it on uh, YouTube for ease, convenience. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marvin Gaye is one of the <laughs> is one of the Green Berets. It's like Tony Young, Peter Brown, and and Marvin Gaye. And all of the comments on the YouTube thing are all "I'm here for Marvin Gaye," and it's like <laughs> Marvin Gaye doesn't have his beard. It's I think it's before his kind of career really kind of took off. Mm-hmm. His singing career, and he's just like he's just one of the guys, and he wears a pirate hat. So this is not like Rio Bravo where he busts into a song or something halfway mm. through. <laughs> no, no. Although I, I'm not sure if there is a song by him in the soundtrack. Like getting, but that's does, he, does he go like, "Let's get it on"? <laughs> <laughs> he just you no, know, he just sings "Pusher Man" when he's trying to. Because because <laughs> basically this biker gang run by William Smith they kill um, this Green Beret's uh, fiance. It was a car accident, sure, and they're responsible for her death. And it's a very very young, very early appearance f- from Cheryl Ladd. Okay, uh, and it's like it's kind of an accident, but not really an accident. Um, and it's like a, the business of a rogue biker. Like it's not the the kind of main biker group. But, sure, um, she has an accident, and her fiance is a Green Beret, so he comes back from from Nam. Mm-hmm. Uh, to get revenge, and he brings his four, his three Green Beret buddies, and they, <laughs> because no one will talk to them, they go undercover as bikers. Right. And Marvin Gaye for the whole movie is what, <laughs> wearing a pirate hat, because <laughs> that's that's what you do if you uh, want to be a black biker in the seventies. It's like a theme of going undercover in biker gangs. <laughs> it's what you do. But right. some of the other bikers, like Larry Bishop, 
is one of the other bikers. The Larry of, um, Bishop, Hellfire? Hellfire, yeah. Hellfire, yeah. Larry Bishop, or Tr- Trigger Happy, which is my one of my all-time favourite films. And he's great. He's like a biker who's obsessed with this pinball machine in their bar. <laughs> and he's like just playing against himself. Yeah, like cool. he's trying to constantly uh, top his high score. And he's totally zonked out the whole movie, but he's great. Uh, and it also stars Kathy Bauman, the delectable Kathy Bauman, <laughs> who uh, is <laughs> like... Like, amazingly attractive, and for some reason, even though she's like a biker mole, and all the bikers are filthy, like, yeah. except the only two that aren't covered in dirt are William Smith <laughs> and Kathy Bauman, who they all they both look remarkably clean. Um, but it's actually, you know, it's, and then like the showdown at the end is literally they, they, the Green Berets go to the army surplus and steal a bunch of, uh, like, rockets and uh, grenades and all sorts of shit, and literally go to town on this biker gang in the middle of the desert. It is pre- it's pretty awesome. Fantastic. I haven't seen it. I want to. It's, it's on YouTube, Matt. Worth, worth looking up. Mm. Directed by Lee Frost, I should say, the, who did The Man With Two Heads and other I will get awesome onto exploitation that. films. I've got an absolute beauty here. Um, <clears throat> a movie that has practically disappeared for decades. You couldn't find it because its lead actor went to prison three months after it was made. I'm talking about the 1977, hugely entertaining... Viva Knievel. <laughs> Starring e- Evil Knievel, Gene Kelly, Lauren Hutton, Red Buttons, and Leslie Nielsen. Like, what a freaking cast what a that cast. is. And what a movie, man. Knievel plays like a fictionalized version of himself. He travels to Mexico to perform a massive stunt. And a crooked promoter, played by Leslie Nielsen, conspires to sabotage the trick, kill Evil Knievel, and tra- traffic cocaine back to the States inside his body. Right, genius, and yet this is quite a family friendly film. Like, go figure, <laughs> but like, rated PG. Gene Kelly plays his mechanic, um, with a weird subplot about an estranged son, which is just strange but kind of wonderful at the same time. It's a little bit clunky, but like, damn, if it's not an hang easy... on, Gene Kelly is playing e- <laughs> Evil Knievel's son, no, Evil Knievel's mechanic, and Gene no, but, uh, Kelly but has he's a also... son. No. I, no, I thought he was also the estranged son. <laughs> no. I know that I'm 50 years older than you, but you are my father. <laughs> no. no, this little boy um, just arrives on the scene and just, like, Gene Kelly's in a truck fixing things. He's a grumpy, can- cantankerous, confrontational old fart. And this little kid comes from nowhere and he goes, Dad! And he turns around and goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, it's just the strangest thing. But it, it works as well. But, um... It feels like the kind of movie <laughs> Hal Needham would have made. Like, you know, that totally. smoking the bandit cannibal run kind of thing. Motorcycles galore, stunts, you know, coming out of nowhere. And my favourite aspect of this is just Evil Knievel trying to act against Gene, Ke- Gene Kelly. Like, there is no contest. Yeah, right. Absolutely no contest. But yeah, after the film was made, because this was, like I said, a, a fairly family-friendly film. And then Evil Knievel got busted... Caught red-handed. Smuggling drugs in his body? <laughs> no. He um, he went to town on a promoter with a baseball bat and shattered his legs. Right? Well, I Beat mean, the shit out of him. If everything I know about promoters is true, that seems to be a completely reasonable and not, response. Not only did that storyline kind of mirror what was happening in the film with like an evil promoter and, and all this kind of stuff. Red Buttons was also a promoter who sort of was trying to shaft him. Yep. But there's a famous TV interview with with uh, Knievel after the prison term where he's he's on TV asking, you know, would you do it again? He's like, damn right I would. Son of a bitch right across me. He goes, I would have killed him too. (laughs) No remorse. Yeah, I'm glad he's dead and I hope they burn in hell. (laughs) But tell you what, it is on uh, YouTube in HD to rent or buy and I highly recommend $4 to watch it because it is something else. The soundtrack is killer as well. All right. All right. So before we hand to Guillermo, one more from you. One more from me. Well, I'm going to talk about a film I'm I'm positive that I've uh, talked about on the show before, but my memory is so bad that <laughs> every show is like the first show. Uh, it's 1976's Hollywood Man, also directed once again by Jack Starrett, once again starring William Smith, except this is the exception to the rule. William Smith is not playing one of the bikers. I don't reckon you have talked about this. Maybe you have on a video. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. Yep. Um, basically, this movie is about... Um, uh, William Smith, who is like a Hollywood, he's a Hollywood action star who sunk one hundred thirty thousand dollars of his own money into this uh, action film, but he can't. He doesn't have it. He's run out, and he needs some help completing it. And he goes to all of his kind of 
connections and all these old producing buddies and tries to get the rest of the money. They all turn him down. But then one of them like hands him a card and says, look, do not, whatever you do, do not call this number. <laughs> Don't do it. And of course, William Smith is desperate, calls the number, and it's basically, he's, he's called the mob. Yep. And they've, they offer to give him the, the money that he needs to complete it, but they've attached these stringent um, uh, kind of insurance things to make sure that he delivers them a, mm-hmm. a fil- he promises that he'll have the film done in four weeks. And to ensure that happens, they put all these conditions onto it. And basically the conditions kind of work out to be, if you don't finish the film in four weeks, the mob own it. All right. So what the mob then decide to do, unbeknownst to William Smith, is they hire this bikey gang to harass the production, not enough to derail the film. They want the film to be made, but just enough so that it delays it so that it goes longer than the four weeks. Sabotage it. They sabotage it, yeah. But of course, William Smith don't take no shit (laughs) and uh, shows up the head biker one too many times so at the end the, he loses the biker loses his shit and decides that he's got to take William Smith out and it is a <laughs> kind of it, and it, like there's the action stunts for the film that suddenly turn real yeah when uh, you know there's sharpshooters and stuff all trying to kill William Smith who's also the star of this film sounds amazing and I don't know yeah. why but like I'm getting images of Dolomite in my head like this <laughs> no 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 this is a, no there's much there's no there's no dodgy kung fu or anything <laughs> like that in this like it's <laughs> It is a Ooh. proper kind of yeah. 70s exploitation awesome. kind of uh, film. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube. Cool. I think that's where I saw it. I, um, I am definitely going to look these up because they're the type of films that I'd love to go back and, and discover. Yeah, definitely awesome. worth your while. Cool. Well, there is more to come, uh, but first we're going to handball things over to Guillermo from Screen Realm for his update. And then uh, we've got a banger, another one from the Stone soundtrack uh, to lead us into my chat with Roger Ward. What's happening everybody, it's Guillermo here again from ScreenRealm.com, Australia's favourite entertainment website covering all things movies and television. Let's talk a little bit about what's gone up on the website in the past week, kicking off with another review by Glenn, this one for The United States vs. Billie Holiday. A biopic on the titular transformative jazz singer, probably one of the most transformative jazz singers of all times. She was an African American woman who rose to fame through adversity and hardship, and she had a big part to play in the civil rights movement as well. Arguably her most famous song is Strange Fruit, which tells the story of black lynching with graphic detail and a somber beauty. In his review, Glenn wrote that it was a bit of a hard one to look at in terms of quality. He was very impressed with Andrew Day's performance as Holiday, and it's no wonder that she's nominated for an Oscar, but was disappointed with not only the delivery by director Lee Daniels, Precious the Butler, but also the fictional elements in the story, which made him doubt how much was real or not. He wrote, there is no doubt whatsoever about the abhorrent history that haunts Western society, nor is there any question about the importance of the civil rights movement and Billy Holiday's role within it. But there is doubt, at least in my mind, as to whether or not we are being given an honest account of Holiday's story here. Two and a half out of five stars, the film opens in Australian cinemas on April 22nd. In the US, it opened on Hulu. On February 26th, the United States vs. Billy Holiday. Check out that full review. Some movie news, Lucy Liu has officially entered the DC screen universe, joining the cast of sequel Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Liu has been cast as a villain named Calypso, a character who isn't from the comics, although is being described as the second daughter of the ancient Greece titan, Atlas. Now this character is sister to Hespera, who as I told you guys a few weeks ago, is going to be played by Helen Mirren. Zachary Levi will be back at Shazam with director David F. Sandberg back at the helm as well. Shazam! Fury of the Gods is set to begin filming in May and is scheduled to open in US cinemas on June 2nd, 2023. And Indiana Jones 5, that's right, Indiana Jones 5 is still on the way. In fact, it's got more cast members now. Phoebe Waller-Bridge, is on board as is Mads Mikkelsen. No plot details have been revealed as yet but Harrison Ford will be back as Indy and John Williams will be back to score as well. As of right now July 29th 2022 is when Indy 5 will be released in cinemas. Looking forward to this and at the same time scared of this. Director Martin Campbell known for GoldenEye, Casino Royale, Vertical Limit, he'll soon be directing Memory a thriller starring Liam Neeson, Guy Pearce, Monica Belushi and Harold Torres. Neeson, who looks like will never give up the action thriller genre even though he said it in the past that he will, 
Neeson will be playing an expert assassin with a reputation for discreet precision. The script comes from Dario Scardapane, who's previously worked on TV shows such as Netflix's The Punisher, The Bridge, and Trauma. And Mike Flanagan, the filmmaker slash TV director known for the Haunting Of series, the first series, he directed every episode of that, Doctor Sleep, Gerald's Game, Hush, I'm a big fan of this director actually, He's set to direct the sci-fi horror adaptation of the novel The Season of Passage. The official synopsis is as follows. Dr. Lauren Wagner was a celebrity. She was involved with the most exciting adventure mankind had ever taken, a manned expedition to Mars. The whole world admired and respected her, but Lauren knew fear. Inside, voices entreating her to love them. Outside, the mystery of the missing group that had gone before her, the dead group. But were they dead? Or something else? Hell yeah man, so this thing can just take my money. Speaking of take my money, get ready for a vampire thriller titled Day Shift, which is set to star, wait for it, Jamie Foxx, Dave Franco, action star Scott Adkins, and Snoop Dogg. Jamie Foxx will be playing a hardworking blue collar dad who just wants to provide a good life for his quick-witted daughter, but his mundane San Fernando Valley pool cleaning job is a front for his real source of income, hunting and killing vampires. Sign me up for that shit right now. That about does it for me, guys. If you are not constantly on ScreenRealm.com, I don't know what's wrong with you. There's nothing I can do to help you. But be sure to get on ScreenRealm.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that jazz. Thanks again for good movie money, guys, for having me. And um, yeah, um, I got nothing else to say. Bye. Such a strange sound there, like from the Stone soundtrack. Uh, that particular piece is called Septic, and it's written and performed once again by Billy Green, which leads us directly to my conversation with Roger Ward. Now, if you're not familiar with Roger Ward, then perhaps you would definitely recognize him. He's that big, surly guy, the tough guy from countless Aussie films. He's often bald in these films, particularly sporting a fat mustache. Um, those super imposing on screen presence that he has throughout his career is no match for his actual kind-hearted and incredibly friendly personality what a gentle giant this guy is indeed sam hung kicks him in the nuts in uh man from hong kong <laughs> on air's rock he's been kicked in the nuts by sam hung on air's rock or uluru whatever you're allowed to call it now <laughs> well what are we waiting for let's jump straight to it here it is my chat with roger ward I'm thrilled to be sitting here with uh, Chief Guard Ritter himself. <laughs> Roger, how are you, mate? 
<laughs> good, good, man. Good. <laughs> That's good. So for people that are that are listening and don't know, that was a reference to Turkey Shoot, of course, which yeah, is a movie yeah. that you were in. Um, but Roger, we're here to um, we're here to talk about Stone. Um, yeah. This movie over the years has had numerous re-releases, you know, from the VHS to the DVD, and now finally Blu-ray. Can you believe yeah. the longevity of this film? No, I can't. I mean, I I know it's now obvious, but it, when we did it, no way. No way in the world could I foresee what's happened now. No. If someone in 1974 had to come up to you and said, in almost 50 years' time, you'll still be talking about it. That's right. I can't believe it. No. Uh, do we, we must have, we made that film in 73, did we? Uh, and it was released in 74. Because I've yeah. always, I always thought we made it in 72 for some unknown reason. And I was reading some research today and it said made in 73. And I've always been talking about 72. <laughs> well, I guess if you if you go back even further to when it was first conceived, it would be 50 years old, really. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, getting, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Incredible. And I, I guess you've talked about the film ad nauseum over the years, but you know, there are going to be some people reading and listening that have you know never seen the film. Uh, so for their benefit, yeah. can you just talk a little bit about making the film? And I, I want to know, did you feel like you were making something special at the time? Well, not really. We In those days, we were doing films pretty well every week, you know, we were doing. It wasn't unusual for us to do a film. And when Sandy said, well, I'm doing a film, do you want to be in it? I said, yeah, sure. And he said, it's a bikey film. I said, oh, that's great. I ride motorbikes. I have, have ridden since I was 17, so no problem. But I said, the only catch is I'm working in a theatre at night. He said, well, that's okay. We'll do a few night shoots. You can come out after your theatre. And uh, or just will shoot up to when you leave for the theatre, you know. So it was no problem really. We were all on a weekly wage anyway. It didn't matter whether I worked day or night. I had a weekly wage coming in from there. Had a weekly wage from the theatre. So I was happy. I was just making a, you know, I was an actor and I was making a living. So I really didn't care or know how important the film was going to be. Although I didn't know it was a good film, but I didn't know it'd have the cult following that it got. No, no way. No. Absolutely, and one of the the cultiest aspects of it was the fact that real Hell's Angels were used during the production. Was that <laughs> exciting, or was it terrifying, or was it both? Well, I didn't see. Despite the fact that I rode a bike, uh, motorbike since I was seventeen, I had no idea of motorbike or clubs. I'd heard of Hell's Angels, of course, but they didn't affect me one way or the other. I didn't care about them. But when we shot with the Hell's Angels, one particular day we did a big scene at the Fourth and Clyde Hotel, and all the Hell's Angels turned up. Well, all the girls we had, we had bikey moles with us who were models and actresses and so on. And they were going apeshit, you know. Oh, my God, <laughs> oh, look at the bike, they're wonderful. <laughs> what? That bunch of scruffy-looking assholes. You know, what's so wonderful about them, you know? So I got yeah. a bit jealous in a way, you know. I mean, I couldn't win one of the girls over, and yet they were quite prepared to fall at the feet of these filthy guys with staggy hair. So I got angry and walked onto the balcony of the hotel, first floor balcony, and yelled out at the top of my voice to the congregated crowd below, all the hell's angels are puffers! <laughs> and uh, there was a, all the bikers, my bikers, they thought, oh my God, we're going to be kicked to death now, and Wardy's <laughs> going to end up dead. But the hell's angels didn't say a word. But the word went out that uh, be careful of the big uh, the big grave digger, which was me. They yeah. said, be careful, he's he's dangerous. You know, so they respected me for what I said and what I did. So right. they, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah. The funny thing when you watch the film, like now, so many years later, is that the motorbikes you guys were riding weren't all that tough. <laughs> like you know, no. compared to today's sort of bikey culture. Oh, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I would have preferred uh, like a Triumph or a Harley Davidson, but when they got crackers, well, you know, what can you say? You, you, you don't argue about it. We got the bikes to use as our own, and we use them for our personal use all the time. Rode to yeah. work on them, and you know, rode anywhere, anywhere everywhere. Mm. Well, as a matter of fact, we used to meet like we'd be located say in North Sydney, and we say had to be there at seven o'clock. So it, co- it just happened that we all congregated on the bridge coming from all the areas of Sydney, we hit the Sydney Harbour Bridge together and suddenly you see, you know, 10, 15, 20, and all of a sudden there's 20 of us hurtling over the Sydney Harbour Bridge heading towards the North Sydney. And I remember one morning my, my speeder didn't work and I said to Hugh Keith Byrne, 
I, I went up alongside of him. I said, what are we doing? What speed? He said, 180. <laughs> I said, oh, God, I'm just sitting here on a bridge. We're doing that 90 mile an hour, you know. That was a kilometre. So, uh, yeah. Oh, had a incredible. lot of fun and games. Yeah. Mm. And the, the film, I believe, if I read correctly, um, Sandy adapted the script from a, a TV cop drama episode. Um, that's what I read. And that, yeah. I think he's quite a trailblazer and it's, it's almost a crime against cinema that he was never able to get another film up. Do you, did mm. you know him well over the years and was that sort of not through lack of trying? Oh, yeah, he tried hard. I, I knew Sandy before the film. Obviously, we were all actors together and we acted in various shows together. And then he said, I've got this film uh, that I'm putting up. He co-wrote the film and produced by David Hanay, who was a mate of mine as well. And David actually got into the business through me uh, and uh, I, I wrote a film years ago and David was got a job through me on that as a producer and went on and never forgot to tell me that he was here because of me, you know. He always told me that, which was nice of him. But um, and no, I didn't know that... Um, I mean, I didn't remember it coming from a television series. I did read that in my research, actually, but I didn't know that. I thought Sandy just wrote it out of the blue because he loved motorbikes. He had his own motorbike and he loved riding motorbikes. And uh, it was certainly a good film. Uh, a little bit boring in places when you see the finished product. But all films I've ever done have had something wrong with them. They're not 100% perfect. But that one would work well. And uh, I thought Sandy did a damn good job with it. And particularly writing, directing and starring. It's, just, it's a pretty major job. But you were saying, uh, did I know that he couldn't get another film up? Yes, he did try. And uh, he did raise money for that one, the first one, mm. from the Australian Film Commission. And they gave him nearly well the whole budget. Now, that film made uh, over a million dollars in return. And he cost about 180000 to make. Uh, so it made 10%. But judging by what it made in those days, it's now about $15 million that would have made. So Sandy did make some money out of it. But the fact is, he did try and make other films. And he said to me not long ago, two or three years ago, he said, I've written another film called Rock, whereas this one's called Stone. This was called Rock. And uh, there were other films he tried to get up in the middle, but he said, Rock is the one. He said, it'd be about a rock band and I want you and Hugh in it and so on as roadies. And, uh, but he said, I sent it to a young director and he said, he didn't even answer my call. He didn't even answer my call. Sandy just couldn't believe that someone would not return yeah. his call, you know, <laughs> join the club, you know. That's, uh, oh, that's, well, that's, I, that's, I, I hope that script is still floating around because, you know, someone needs to get hold of it, you know, just as a legacy and a tribute. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, actually, there is a script here that I've got hold of. Uh, Welcome to Hell. I don't know if you read that. Welcome yeah. to Hell. Yeah, uh, quite a thick one. And I met this guy at Sandy's funeral. And... Um, He's from Queensland. He's a biker, and he's written a script. It's about 270 pages. It's far too long, which I've tried to tell him. He won't listen to me. But Sandy did authorise this on his deathbed, virtually. Uh, this guy went and saw Sandy, and Sandy normally wouldn't wouldn't allow anybody to write another film about Stone. And he always yeah. said, "Now I've sold the rights. I, you know, forget it. You can't come to me about it." He actually did sell the rights to the to the name. Mm. But this guy apparently was authorised by Sandy to write it and, and David and I loved it. So he says, I don't know, both are, you know, both are gone now. Yeah. But this guy is a Queensland guy and I got on the bandwagon for it and I said, it's too long, mate. We've got to condense it down. And uh, he wouldn't listen to reason. So I've let it, left it go, let it go. But it is about the bikey scene, yeah. two generations. And as I say, Sandy authorised it. I don't think it'll ever be made. No. Yeah, what a shame. Do you reckon? Yeah. Do you reckon the movie Stone uh, defined the type of characters that you would play over the years? No, it, it didn't define my type of character. No, I've played a great diversity of characters. Like, I, for instance, I was playing hooks in the daytime, and I was working on the theatre at night with a dinner suit on. So, um, I'm very uh, diversifiable in my work. And no, it hasn't. But I did do what I could do to make that character of interest. Mm. Like I did certain things for that character that wasn't in the script. And uh, the hat, for instance, I bought, the gloves I wore, 
uh, various parts of my clothing I created. So I create my characters to suit me. And uh, I remember David and I said to me once, he said, if you never ever make another film, that scene of the card playing with you stealing card playing strip jack naked mm -hmm. will live on in memory. He said, you can be proud of that scene if you never ever make another film. It was nice of David to say that, but I've done a lot of, not, not bragging, but I've done a lot of good performances in mediocre and good films, but no one seems to take the notice. They just accept the fact that, oh, Wardy's doing his thing. And so I'm just a working actor and do what I can do with the material, you know. Oh, mate, you have an incredible legacy as far as I'm concerned. And even before Mad Max was made, you had made like The Irishman and Mad Dog Morgan, Man from Hong Kong, Death Cheaters. Like, you know, you were really hot stuff in those days. And just, it, I think then Mad Max came along and just set you on fire. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I, I was. I'm, I'm lucky, as I say, in my not my choice. I've been chosen to do those films. I've never turned a film down in my life, yeah. uh, um, but I was lucky to have those particular roles, or I was lucky to be allowed to do my own interpretation of those yeah. roles to make them a little more interesting than maybe they were written. You know. And so, so much of Stone found its way into Mad Max, including cast members, but also just themes and, and sort of the way it looks, style and all that stuff. What was the sentiment around the time Mad Max came out about that? Did it Was there any kind of feeling that, you know, it was sort of borrowing or...? No, you know, not, no? not that I knew of, no. I never gave it a thought, actually, despite the fact that uh, Vince Gill was in it and uh, Hugh Keys Byrne was in it. Yeah. Uh, David Brax was in it. We were all in Stone. But I never gave it a thought. See, uh, Mad Max was mostly about cars. Uh, yeah. It was a car yeah. film, although the bikers were there, of course, but the bikers were there in persona, not necessarily the bikes weren't as much a, a persona of the film as they were in Stone. But it was a car movie, really, as far as I'm concerned. But I do I do get the, the, the connotation, and it's similar, but it's not the same, you know? Yeah, I guess that probably came from some of the marketing when Stone got re-released was, you know, you've seen Mad Max, now see Stone, you know, it's probably what's done. Exactly, it. Yeah, 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 that's right, what was it, yeah, first, you can, first we saw Stone now, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I, I didn't, I didn't really treat the two, but of course I was a bit, not greedy, but I was just jumping from one film to the other, counting the money for this film as I'm doing it, and then counting the money for the next one, so I just sort of was, <laughs> You know, thinking when's this one finished, I've, I've got to start another. It was because it's during the 10 BA, uh, the tax concession. You remember that 10 BA can tax concession where everybody could make people with money could put money into a film and get a 150% yeah. back. Yeah. So people were pouring money into films. They didn't care what the script was. They just wanted yeah. to put their 150% and in and get enough. Well, we were similar as actors. We were similar saying, oh, wow, there's another film coming up. You know, I've got one next week and then the following week. So we didn't really care. Um, yeah. It wasn't till 20, 30 years later that I, I said, well, God, I wish I took more notice. Like I said to you a while ago, I don't remember. It was 72 or 73 <laughs> that I made the film. My, yeah. my diaries are in the shed. And I said to my wife today, I really should go down and find my 1972, 1973 diary and just see when it was made because it's, it's just a blur. All those films are just a blur, you know. And, yeah. Uh, oh, it's Fantastic. Before I move away from Mad Max, I just need to ask you just who was responsible for your wardrobe in that film? Because that is a thing of beauty. Mad Max wardrobe? Yeah. The leather yeah. pants, the scarf around the neck. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, the leather pants and the and the jacket were from from Miller. But yeah. I decided when I found out I was doing a bare top scene, or when I had to take my top off, I thought it looks a bit bare. Uh, so I, I went to a friend of mine, a female friend. She was a, a machinist. And I got her to make me that big black scarf, and uh, that was that was what gave me that persona. But of course, with the leather pants and the black flowing uh, scarf and the uh, the uh, little watering bottle, everybody started to talk about you know camp, big bear. <laughs> you know, I didn't give that a thought either. But all the bears in in town were loving Fifi. They thought Fifi is wonderful, and I, I didn't even give that a thought. You know, I just thought. I only wore the scarf to cover the uh, the barrenness of the chest, you know. Oh, mate, it's iconic, and I say that respectfully. Like, I, I absolutely adore it. It's such it's such a, a striking image in, you know, in that movie. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, well, I always try and make some some scenario in a film 
to make it a little better than it could be or was or uh, will be. But uh, I just do these things uh, spontaneously. And, uh, you know, I remember years ago when I was a youngster, I was doing a play on stage playing a millionaire, a miserly millionaire. And uh, I said to my mother, would you cut the back out of my shirt and, and tape it so that, you know, it's all straggly with no, like a shirt. But mm. when I turn my back on the audience, I've got a great big hole in my shirt. And it was a comedy, luckily, and it was pretty corny, but I was this miserly millionaire guy and suddenly through the play, I took my coat off and turned with my back to the audience and there was this shirt with all shattered edges and everything. And the audience <laughs> just roared with laughter. You know, they, they got the message. They understood that this old miser wouldn't even buy a new shirt, but <laughs> they got the message, you know. So I've always tried to do something in my scenarios yeah. to, you know, yeah. Where does... Where does... Where does Stone sit for you amongst sort of your body of work? Is it right up there for you? No, it's not really. I was only saying to my wife today, I, I, I wrote a biography some years ago uh, and never did anything with it. And I went through trying to find it today to find my references to Stone so that I have some information for you. Yeah. But there's, no, there's no mention of Stone in the damn thing. <laughs> so that's how much it influenced me. <laughs> so, well, that that will come to a as a, a surprise for a lot of people. Yeah, well, I mean, to me, it wasn't a it wasn't an outstanding film. A Man from Hong Kong for me was a was a breakthrough. Mad Max was a breakthrough. Irishman was not. Uh, as a, you know, a lot of them weren't, uh, mm. but there were a lot that were. So, but Stone didn't didn't turn me on greatly because I I don't know I didn't I didn't uh, particularly like the character as much as I could have. I mean, I thought that he was a bit too clean. Uh, the reason I was clean was because I was working in the theatre at night. I couldn't yeah. be scraggly, I couldn't grow a beard, couldn't have a proper pierced ear. Um, so I didn't really, or I wasn't able to create the character that I really wanted to create. But subconsciously, I must have pushed it out of my mind to hardly mention it, or can't even find a <laughs> reference of it in my biography. <laughs> oh mate! Well, look, looking back over your career, do you have a particular favourite film that you've made? No, I, I get asked that a lot. There's none of my films that are, that I like 100. percent You know, yeah. some of the films yeah. I like, like I like Mad Max. I like like performances in Mad Max, although Mad Max has its failures in there as a film itself. It has its failures. Mad from Hong Kong the same. I I like my performance in there, but. To see the whole film, it's a bit of a oh god, you know that <laughs> bit, bit boring. So every film I've ever done has always got something wrong. So I can't say that I love all my films. I love most of my performances though, but, but yeah. I do. I've got to the stage now where I pretty well know what I'm going to look like. But in the early days, I had no idea, and I used to be quite embarrassed when I saw my stuff, my earlier television stuff played back. I mean, oh my god, you know what am I doing? What? So, but now. I get to the stage where I do know technically what I'm doing and so on, you know. Well, I also say this respectfully, but you will always be the kitten chef from Young Einstein to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, uh, that's a funny film, that one. Yes, I was, funnily enough, I was doing another film with um, a children's film, a pirate film, and I was playing a pirate. And I got the call to go and see Young Einstein guy, uh, Yahoo Serious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he said, would you come in and have a chat? Well, I went straight from the from the filming of that with full makeup on. And I forgot, you know, I mean, I sort of, right, I turned up with all this brown makeup on, looked like, you know, suntan. He said, my God, you've got a great suntan. And I said, oh, my God, I've got makeup on. So I didn't say anything. I just, I just let him figure out a good suntan. <laughs> that was another uh, unusual role, that one. Yeah. yeah for that's sure, right. for I, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I do love that performance. It's probably the first time when I was a child that I, I, I understood who you were, like it's what put you on my radar. And from then, you know, the rest is yeah. history for sure. But, yeah, um, well, great. Roger, it's only been a short time uh, today, but, Dan, it's been a fun time. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk. Okay, Glenn, it was lovely to do it. Yeah, thanks very much, mate. Roger Moore. <laughs> Roger no. Moore, Roger Ward, Roger, no, no. Bert Ward. Ward and Roger Bert Miller. Ward and Roger Miller's. Are and if you take the two of them and put them together, you get the great Roger Ward. That is one impressive skull, Mister Ward. Yeah, the only the only man who could rock a beard and a bald head better than 
Tom Hardy and Bron Bronson and Francis Roach, the guy from uh, Indiana Jones who got killed by the airplane propeller. I oh, just, yeah. there's that's, one that's... other, there's one other, the late great Sid Haig. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Sid Haig did well. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. So Which, Roger way, Ward, you're up there with royalty. I was going to say, and that's what I wanted to say. Roger Ward does one of the best in, in Turkey Shoot. There is something about the way he plays the chief guard that is just, I mean, and I mean this with absolute respect because I grew up on these cartoons, snidely whiplash level, like malevolence it, it, to an adult level. Like, it, which, by the way, why didn't we get a snidely whiplash movie starring Roger Ward? According to Glenn, that's actually the character he's playing in Turkey Shoot is the closest to his real personality. That's what Glenn told me, Roger. I don't know. I'm Which just, is terrifying because that is he, he. I know why would Glenn be telling me this across the world about someone I haven't met and just speaking ill of them? I don't understand, <laughs> Roger. I think you should take it up with Glenn. I think you should just reenact turkey shoot with Glenn. With Glenn, one of my Especially favorite. The shower roles. scene. Why Wait. do I want that? Why do I want that? <laughs> I don't know. I thought you were talking about Psycho for a second. So one of my favorite roles is he's making pies out of cats. And young Einstein. Now, as much as I love Yahoo Serious, there's only two people that I remember 20 years later from that movie. Yahoo Serious and Roger Ward making pies out of cats. Why, <laughs> sir? Why? I have two cats. You can't do that. He didn't really do it, did he, guys? I mean, if he did, what do you flavor cat with? Why doesn't Roger Ward have an entire line of cat flavoring seasonings? Oh my God, dude! That Go would sell on the copyright horror that, circuit. Then sell it to Roger. That would sell on the horror circuit like gangbusters, right? Like that yeah. would just be an entire thing. Like, yeah. Oh, it's lemon pepper cat. And you sell it with a complimentary hammer. <laughs> poor, poor kitty. Or, or a hacksaw. Some people like to take a hacksaw to a cat's head. Hey, you got to tenderize it, James. <laughs> I feel like we've taken it just too far, or just not far enough. All right, while James is hacksawing a cat and thinking of Roger, Chad? I'm going to jump in because, I mean, with, with James, Turkey Shoot is probably Roger's most memorable performance for me just because he was so evil in that movie. It was great. Um, I know he's you got Mad Max. You have yeah, you got um, Young Einstein right. but, and, a, and a list of other movies. But his performance. Oh, and Quigley Down Under, Quigley, one of my Quigley favorite ones. Wiggly Down Under. By the way. Out. That not not a not one of my favorite Australian one, one of my favorite Western period. He's in one of my favorite Westerns, period. Quickly yes. down under. Yeah, same here. And I mean, you know, we could even talk about or you know, more recent performances like his role in Boar, but Turkey mm -hmm. Shoot, seriously, he's it's just it gets to you. He, he's so evil in that film, and and uh, there's nothing that tops that. I only have one question for him. I just would like to hear his biggest or best Christy McNichols a bitch story. To quote Family Guy, this this after school special didn't work out with work out for Christy McNichol, but very little. Did. All I can say is you wouldn't be very happy if you were playing a character named Mabel. There you go. I don't know. I don't know. What am I getting paid? Roger, we want to thank you not only for your tremendous skull, but also for all the great performances of being. Oh, <laughs> you scared me throughout cinema history this has been bonehead weekly fun size well you've got to love those guys mate like despite having a bunch of segments already banked and ready for us um those guys recorded that one at a drop of a hat uh i get a sneaky suspicion they don't really know many roger ward films <laughs> well they, they, they seem to know turkey shoot of course uh well, they recently had Brian Trenchard Smith on their show, right? And I think they talked about a few films, so they'd recognise him for sure from a few. But um, nevertheless, I'm impressed. Joe, Chad, and James are able to deliver a completely unplanned spur of the moment segment to align they with give today's you a show. Bit of shit in that segment too. Yeah, they certainly do. <laughs> when do they not give me shit? <laughs> I don't know what Glenn was thinking in that one. <laughs> That seems to be... Uh... My favourite is always like, I don't know who Glenn had the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> but we're kind of jealous. 
<laughs> anyway, their own show, Bonehead Weekly, can be found on the Project Louder Network, or you can find them wherever you get your podcast from. I recommend YouTube because they also record videos of their podcast and you can watch them with their guests. Um, so one of their most recent guests actually was Nicholas Meyer, the director of Wrath of Khan and Time After Time and Volunteers. I did listen to that uh, episode. Yeah. Like, what a guy. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think and he's like written a book, which I didn't uh, kind of get. At, like, like they're talking about the book. Yeah. But at the start, you're like, you're like, are they talking to this guy? What are they what book are they referring to? I don't think... Oh, he's written a book. Okay. I, I don't think they were prepared for his smarts. Like, he was right. really switched on. Super, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and before the Boneheads, of course, I uh, hope you enjoyed my chat with Roger Ward. Absolute bloody legend. And we do have a copy of Stone to give away on Blu-ray. Um, this is a brilliant Blu-ray release. It's region-free, which means that... Why um, didn't you tell me this? I just would have taken it myself. <laughs> well, the, the fact that it's region-free means that you can enter this competition from anywhere in the world. As um, long as you're willing to pay for it. I will pay for that for you. Umbrella Entertainment have done a wicked job on this one. Uh, not only does it look better than ever, but it contains an isolated soundtrack. Um, it's all put together by... Um, Mark Hartley. It was, uh, the, the director of Not Quite Hollywood. And done done with Sandy Harbutt, like literally they they locked it weeks before he passed away. Yeah, so it is a really, um, it's a personal impassioned kind of release. It's got the documentary Stone Forever included, lots of stuff from the Not Quite Hollywood vaults and um, even an interview with Tarantino about the film. So to win this Blu-ray, tell us what your favourite Roger Ward movies are in the comments section of this episode on our Facebook page. And we're going to select the winner at random we also have two supplementary prizes up for grabs uh, for the, the follow-up winners. And um, get typing. We'd love to hear what you think of his films. I mean, here's a hint. If you say touch and go, you're going to win. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> a lot of really. Melbourneites have probably had interactions with Roger, so I'd love to hear stories. Yeah. So anyway, moving on, when tasked with discussing motorcycle-themed films for his recommendation, this is what Adam came up with. Guys, it's Adam here from Adam's Just Seen with another Good Movie Monday recommendation. This week we are doing motorcycle films. Now, I've covered before a bunch of movies with motorcycles in them that I think are rock and roll. I've done T2, I've done The Place Beyond the Pines, so I have to go with a different tact. Now, I the one motorcycle chase, and I love motorcycle chases, that springs to my mind that if I want to test out my home theatre system is the motor, motorbike chase in Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Now, this has got the distinction of being one of the very few film franchises that just gets better with every instalment. This has Christopher, Christopher McQuarrie coming in after Brad Bird uh, and just basically surprising the hell out of me and I think everyone else by nailing it. And now Chris McQuarrie has kind of become the Mission Impossible dude. Now, the motorcycle chase in this one is so high octane, it almost rips your eyeballs out. Tom Cruise here and Rebecca Ferguson are involved in you know this high speed chase that honestly boggles my mind because one Cruz is wearing this incredibly loud shirt it's a major flex I love it and he's not wearing a helmet and it just looks like he's doing it and everything that I've heard about the maniac that is Tom Cruise is that if he can do it he will do it and it looks like he is completely front and center here some of the stuff that is cross flowing into traffic is a little bit CGI enhanced but pound for pound, it's Cruz doing what he does best. I mean, look, Rogue Nation was always going to be a rock and roll action movie when it started out with a stunt of Cruz hanging on to a goddamn aeroplane. Now, I heard that they had to make special made contact lenses so that his eyes didn't get damaged pulling this thing off. So, I mean, look, I'm a huge fan of the Mission Impossible franchise. If you had have told me that 10 years ago, I really honestly wouldn't have believed that these films would have evolved into the roller coasters that they are. I think that they just, they know the formula. They keep introducing, you know, really interesting actors into this action space and yeah bring it on for the next two installments i believe they're doing back to back cannot get enough of them mission impossible rogue nation a five-star action film check it out so if you pick up what adam is putting down then um make sure you give him some love head to his facebook page adam's just seen and you can also catch him on his regular appearances on Ticker TV and Triple M Radio. Adam will be back next week, of course, with us. Um, but right now, we enter the home stretch, and we've got one more movie each to recommend to you. Ben has primed his engine. Uh, at least that's how I choose to interpret the bottle of lube un underneath his desk. Um, so how about... The lube's not for me, mate. It's for you. <laughs> oh, <wait. Ooh. laughs> 
We run. I just realized there's two ways you can take that. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. And I don't mind. I don't mind which way you take it. Okay, so um, why don't we just um, move on from that and uh, you can run through some notable mentions and maybe stop at one that you can discuss as a I, recommendation. I can't really because I didn't, I didn't make that list like you asked me to. Uh, <laughs> of notable mentions. I did try and watch, I thought, like, I thought as a joke, I'm just going to watch shitty recent ones. Yep. And like, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to watch talk. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. Is that Martin? Martin Henderson, Henderson Ice Cube, it. like Jay Hernandez. It was them trying to emulate Fast and the Furious, right? Yeah. yeah. The motor- motorcycle version. Biker motor- Boys was the, another one. The motorbuckle, yeah. as uh, as you would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mo- hang on. Let's, <laughs> let's add some context for people listening because that wasn't in the show. No, that was uh, after... After take 20. <laughs> I kept saying of, motorbike. Uh, of Glenn's introduction to Adam. <laughs> keep calling it motorbike themes. <laughs> motorbike themes. Uh, Shattered the illusion right like, there. I mean, the reason I did want to watch it, and it actually, like, once it got into it, 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 was, it did enter into the so bad it's good territory. Yeah, right. Um, but I watched it because Jamie Presley, I think, is possibly the most attractive woman living today. That's a and huge call. She's, I, it is. And it's at that time. I'm sorry, Monica Bellucci. Who? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I tried to watch it. And instead, I decided to revisit a film that I first watched on my first overseas trip. The first time ever going living Australia and going to the US. Yep. First time ever living in Australia. Second time ever being on a plane. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was one of those times where I, I'm, I'm almost positive... Because otherwise, why would I have watched this? Where they had you didn't have individual TVs you had the on screen. the screen. You had the screen, and you had to watch, everyone watch the same movie. Yep. And the movie they chose to put on was the newly released Disney slash Touchstone <laughs> uh, box office smash that is Wild Hogs <laughs> <laughs> from two thousand seven. And I look, I I watched it again. And I, I have to say, I enjoyed this movie. I a lot. enjoyed it. Yeah, I really liked it. It's it is funny. It is, it is funny. It is incredibly like cancel worthy now. Like they are so homophobic <laughs> in this film. Everyone, including <laughs> including John C. McGinley, who's playing like a gay highway cop. <laughs> like they're all <laughs> so kind of ridiculously over the top homophobic. It's not funny. But it's directed by Walt Becker, who also directed uh, Van Wilder Party Liaison. <laughs> yes. And uh, he, <laughs> he also directed uh, Old Dogs with John Travolta. And the, Robin the, Williams and Robin Williams and the box office flop that that was is the reason why there is no Wild Hog sequel <laughs> that they were planning to make with the all original cast. Uh, so basically, this movie it's just it's like a it's not not so much a midlife crisis, but it's about a bunch of like older men kind of just trying to rediscover themselves yeah. while on a road trip. Um, and then they run afoul of a real, they're like, <laughs> yeah. they're suburban warriors and they, they run afoul of the Del Fuego motorcycle gang, a real motorcycle gang. Because uh, they feel really badass up until that point. Up until that point, yeah. <laughs> and then and they then look like complete pussies. <laughs> like, and like, I have to give it to John Travolta, who is, who is at his overacting best in yep. this, in this film. But there is that one scene where Ray Liotta first confronts him and pulls his sunglasses off. And I, at first I thought he was trying to do a chili palmer. Like he does this kind of like, you know, like, look at me. Like he, like this whole, like that whole kind of thing, you know, when he's dealing with uh, all the, the other heavies in, in, in Get Shorty, but he's actually like doing a piss take of Clint Eastwood, <laughs> which apparently was just a, an ad lib, <laughs> like an ad lib, like, cause they'd done 20 <laughs> takes of yeah. it already. Um, and yeah, so they run a foul of Ray Liotta's gang. And then so Ray Liotta, and they accidentally blow up their clubhouse and destroy all of their bikes. So they're, then the rest of the movies then being hunted. It is uh, a, it, by it, the Del Fuegos, who were originally going to be the Hell's Angels, but the Hell's Angels sued Disney, <laughs> <laughs> so they so they swapped it to uh, the Del Fuegos. And in the, the film, they go to this town, and and Stephen Tobolowsky, who this is his second appearance because he's also playing a highway cop in uh, Roadside Profits, funnily enough, <laughs> uh, is the sheriff, and um, Marissa Tomei is like the proprietor of a, of an inn. Yeah. And they kind of hole up there, and they, they, this it's like the wild one where the, the, the bikers kind of invade the town, and yeah. the, you know, they kind of have to defend the town. It's like three amigos, too, like, it's a lot of things like kind of like this. But they, that 
that diner they built it in uh, New Mexico for the film that basically built that town. Yeah. But when they left, the town asked them to keep. They wanted to keep <laughs> yeah. the building, and that building is still there today. And it is a like a um, gift shop that sells Wild Hog <laughs> and Del Fuego like merch. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. That's worth a that's worth a ticket to worth America it, yeah. alone. Yeah. Uh, what a like what if a, I would have known, I would totally go. There. What an unlikely ensemble cast that just works. Like you got Tim Allen and William H Macy. You know, like. <sighs> John Travolta, Ray Liotta, Marissa Tomei, Jill Hennessy, MC Ganey is one of the bikers. Peter Fonda pops up. In a very sort of tokenistic yeah. way, but funny. Yeah, totally. Like, it, yeah. And it's 100% a nod to Easy Rider. And yeah. there's even a scene where he does, you know, <laughs> lose the wristwatches, which is like a throwback yeah. to Easy Rider yeah. and, and stuff. Like it is a... Um, and he, but he's, he's so decked out in leather. Like he looks more like a wild hog than the rest of the wild hogs. He does not look like the denim clad, yep. dirty bikers of the Del Fuegos, even though he is technically yeah. the <laughs> the granddaddy of the Del Fuegos. Oh man, awesome. I'm really glad that we had a chance to talk about wild hogs because I don't think uh, enough people do. No. Um, I think it should be in the ty- in the description, episode description. <laughs> well, yeah, like, I'll, the, I'll certainly the hashtag wild hogs, it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I was surprised at how many biker movies there are, like on offer out there, because in researching this, I was spoilt for choice. And I also wasted time watching Werewolves on Wheels. That was terrible. <laughs> Absolute Classic. shit house. Uh, some honorable mentions on my list, though. The Wraith, of course, once again with Charlie motor- Sheen. He mo- he's he's a- the motorcycle Wraith. Like, he's, he's a ghost a on wheels. I thought it was a car. Well, yes, but before he dies, remember, he's the motorcycle guy right. and his brother has a motorcycle. You're right. Harley Davis and the Marlboro Man. I just. Fumbled my way through that. I only like that movie because of Chelsea Field. Uh, Purple Rain. Like, glorious motorcycle in that one. I think you should just give me a small round of applause. Because <laughs> the minute you said Purple Rain, in my head, me singing Purple Rain popped out. And I, I was like, keep your mouth shut, Hellwig. <laughs> I have done that on a previous show. We had an episode dedicated to Purple Rain. And I sang it with Jared. <laughs> um, Rumble Fish, Place Beyond the Pines. Dirt Bike Kid. Like, can't go past that. Uh, she Devil on Wheels. And, of course, Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town. Classic. It's classic. But I have to be true to myself, Ben. Um, even if predictable, I can't ignore the wonderful 1982 classic, Grease 2. So the movie that uh, most people thought they wanted but quickly realised they didn't. Um, Rex Manning on a motorcycle. Yeah, it's one that I'm in- eternally thankful for because uh, although it's disjointed, I enjoy it even more than the original. It's um, Michelle Pfeiffer, Maxwell Caulfield, Christopher McDonald, Lorna Luft, who I had a huge crush on and probably still do uh dotty goodman well if, if anyone would know if you still have a crush on her it's you <laughs> that's true well it's probably like you should be able to give a definitive answer to that <laughs> well you know still like, got, i can't still got monica, monica bellucci in my head so you know. <laughs> <laughs> she's, always, she's no jamie presley <laughs> directed by patricia bird who um who choreographed the first film like, right so there's the tie in there uh i just think this one like overflows with character like it's just a really dynamic kind of movie it's it's different to the first one it's a whole other beast like the the songs don't provide a narrative like the first one they're just sort of individual songs that sort of narrate a scene right but joined together they don't do anything but um they're good songs it marches to a different beat and um the tragedy here is that when they made that film when they greenlit it they were signed on to make a third one and right. and because this one tanked, it never happened. Never happened. I, look, Although I that just, did that, as I've said many times, number three became High School Musical. So yeah, right. Yeah. Like I, I don't. It's been a long, long time since I've seen Grease Two. I don't. All I really remember is Chris McDonald and then and a and a motorcycle stunt at the end. <laughs> That's all I can really remember. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Or oh, the the Ring of Fire, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Crater Face from the Scorpions from the first film trades his four wheels in for two wheels. Like you know, he's still yeah. a loser. Has obviously not graduated like the rest of them, or he just he's one of those guys he's that hangs a, around. I just thought he was a bad motherfucker. In the first <laughs> one. I didn't think he was a loser. I mean, just because he lost, he lost <laughs> that one time. <laughs> well, the real loser is Frenchie, who's repeating high school. Well, like you well, know, she is a beauty school dropout. That's true. <laughs> anyway, it's a great film. Wow. Well, Oh, here come the popo, Ben. <laughs> popo. Uh, I love that music so much that I'm um, giving it another spin there. That's the end of the show. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. Uh, we have fun recording it. And um, we want to give a massive shout out to Roger Ward for being a great sport and um, making time for us in general. 
Um, we will have him back somewhere at some time because there's so much more to talk about outside of stone. Uh, muchos gracias, Ben. Another fun one in the can. Thank you very much. And I do want to give a quick shout out to every which way you can and any which way but loose. Two films that technically aren't biker films, though they do feature motorcycle gangs. Yes. Uh, the Black Widows. <laughs> so every time I see one, I just stand on it and squish it. Uh, are, they are cl two of Clint Eastwood's finest films. Highly recommend those uh, if you're even in vaguely interested in just like... If you, were, if you like your biker movies with bikers in the peripheral. Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree more. And uh, massive holler out to our good mates, Jarrett, Garn, Guillermo Troncoso, Adam Ross, and the Boneheads themselves, Joe, Chad, and James. You actually said that, like, uh, Jarrett and Garn were two different people. You're like, Jarrett, Garn. <laughs> like, like there was a comma there. <laughs> our good mate, Garny. <laughs> well. He's got a new segment on the show called... Uh, <laughs> Garrett's Garn gone. Garney's Garage, <laughs> where he takes us through all the things he's selling on eBay this week. Let's spitball some ideas. We can <laughs> get another segment out of him. <laughs> to become one. <laughs> oh, shit. And finally, remember to catch our midweek video content on Facebook and YouTube this week. You can see Roger shouting out Poofta in the uh, actual video from tomorrow night. Uh, it's a, that's a part of the interview that never made it into Stack Magazine, I can tell you. <laughs> And on Thursday night, Ben and I look back on a sci-fi motorcycle movie that you will all want to track down for yourself. So thanks for listening. Uh, we, we'll be back same time next week to do it all over again, possibly with a Mortal Kombat theme. Anyway, Ooh. here's another beauty from the Stone Ooh. soundtrack to send you on your way. It's a title called Stone, the title track itself by Billy Green. Enjoy it. Have a grouse week, everyone. Catch you then.